Welcome to Spoken Vespers for the Festival of Epiphany for Bethlehem Lutheran Church and for St. Luke United Lutheran Church. You may find a bulletin on stlukeunitedlutheran.org under the Connect With Us tab. We begin today. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us, Lord, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and illumine your church. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, you revealed the incarnation of your Son by the brilliant shining of a star. Shine the light of your justice always in our hearts and over all lands. Accept our lives as the treasure we offer in your praise and for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading for today comes from the book of Isaiah, the 60th chapter. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For the darkness shall cover the earth, and the thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and the glory of the Lord will appear over you. Nation shall come to your light, and rulers to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant. Your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Epheth. All those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and proclaim the praise of the Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 72, and I invite you to join me in repeating the psalm responsively. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son, that he may rule your people with righteously and the poor with justice, that the mountain may bring prosperity to the people and the hills in righteousness. Let him defend the needy among the people, rescue the poor, and crush the oppressor. May he live as long as the sun and moon endure, from one generation to another. Let him come down like rain upon the mown field, like showers that water the earth. In his time may the, glory, may the righteous flourish, and let there be an abundance of peace till the moon shall be no more. May the kings of Tarshish and the isles pay tribute, and the kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. May all kings bow down before him, and all the nations do him service. For the king delivers the poor who cry out in distress, the oppressed and those who have no helper. He has compassion on the lowly and poor, and preserves the lives of the needy. From oppression and violence, he redeems their lives, and precious is their blood in his sight. The second reading is from the letter to the Ephesians, the third chapter. This is the reason that I, Paul, am a prisoner for Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles. For surely you have already heard of the commission of God's grace 
that was given me for you, and how the mystery was made known to me by revelation, as I wrote above in a few words, a reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, as it is now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, the Gentiles have become heirs with us, members of the same body, and sharers in the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of God's power. Although I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ, and to make everyone see what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things, so that through the church the wisdom of God in its rich variety might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose of God that was carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, through faith in whom we have access to God in boldness and confidence. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, according to St. Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler, who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring word to me, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Welcome to the service in which we celebrate Epiphany and the story of the two kings. Wait. Two kings? I thought it was the three kings. No, you heard me right. This is the church festival in which we study two kings, not three as the old song goes. So today we are not going to be focusing on the men who came from the east, who actually were not kings at all, but rather we are going to spend time with the two characters who, while important, are sometimes thought of as secondary players in this story of quests, power, and ultimately salvation. As our gospel for today opens, we are met right off the bat with one of these two kings, King Herod. Now, there are many Herods in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, so 
which Herod is this one? This Herod was Herod the Great. He was the Herod who was the father of all those other Herods that we hear about throughout the Gospel stories. He lived from about 75 to 4 BCE, that is, before Common Error, and was the person responsible for the expansion of the temple at the heart not only of Jerusalem, but at the heart of Judaism as well. But his building programs are only part of what he is remembered for. Herod the Great is arguably better remembered as a tyrant who would stop at nothing to stay in power. Although he was called King of the Jews, Herod was actually not a king in the line of David. Rather, he was a king put into place by the rulers of the Roman Empire. Therefore, according to many in the Jewish population, he represented not a divinely seated ruler, but rather the henchmen of the powers that be in Rome. You know, he was kind of like the grubby little gophers who do the work of the mob boss in those old gangster movies of the 20s and the 30s. And in order to do these dirty deeds, Herod was known for his quick use of the sword, not only to keep the country in order, but also to make sure that he stayed where he was, in power. Herod was so scared of losing power that, in fact, he killed off one of his two wives, two of his sons, and countless political enemies. But perhaps you will remember him from one of his most infamous deeds, the murder in cold blood of all the boys under the age of two in Bethlehem shortly after the birth of Jesus. Nice guy, right? It is this king that the men from the east, often called magi, come to see to ask where they might find the child born king of the Jews. No wonder Herod gets so worried and upset and frightened. If he was so worried about losing his seat of power, to which honestly he had no rightful claim, there is no question about why he would gather together his chief advisors to try to discover who this new king was. But then also to have the Magi bring him back the knowledge he needed in order to get rid of this budding threat. So after spending some time with Herod in Jerusalem, we, along with the three Magi, are off on our way to visit yet another king, the second king we're focusing on today. However, this second king does not have much in the way of worldly power. He does not live in a palace, and nor does he work for the Roman Empire. This king is found in the town of Bethlehem, about seven miles outside of Jerusalem. This king could have easily been forgotten because of the humble beginnings in which he was born. But this king does not fear losing power, for it is this king that has all the power of the universe. This king does not build earthly structures that will crumble or be destroyed. Rather, this king builds a kingdom that will endure for all times and all peoples. For this ruler does not look like the kings that we know, both from the Bible and from around the world, both in the past and in the here and the now because this king is the Christ child. Just as we heard about 12 days ago when we read the text from the Gospel of Luke, this king is the child that is born a savior who is the Messiah of our Lord. This child is God in a human body, God who willingly came to live a human life, and is, as Handel wrote, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yet despite not knowing what one would bring and expect in a king, 
these magi knelt down and they paid the Christ child, Jesus, son of Mary and son of Joseph, homage. That is to say, they worshiped him. And while this all happened thousands of years ago, it still plays out today and every day in our lives. For while we can still see Herods all around us, we also know that Christ continues to be with us throughout our journey in this life. But what is even more interesting is that we can also see these two kings right here and right now. Where? Within each and every one of ourselves. For we as human beings... We are what Luther would call saints and sinners at the same time. This saint and sinner at once has become a catchphrase for Lutherans. But what, as Luther would ask, does this mean? It means that we live in a world that tells us that we must be in power whenever possible and that we must hold that power whenever we're able to obtain it through whatever means possible. We live in a world that leads us down the path to sin in order to maintain that power. Luther, in his large catechism, talks a great deal about the first commandment, whereas our confirmation students should be able to tell you we are commanded to have no other gods. To have another god, Luther says, means not necessarily having a golden idol to which we might pray, or another spiritual being to whom we give our allegiance. But rather, it is that thing in which we put all of our trust and security. Oftentimes it feels as if in modern America, that idol is power. It seems more sleep and life has been lost over power, or lack thereof, than for any other reason. But as we know, power is not the only thing that attempts to be a false god. There are many things that try to allure us into a false sense of security. And it is very easy for us, imperfect humans, to fall prey to those things and therefore into sin. But the good news is this. The good news is that while we were still sinners, Herod's in our own ways. We who have tried to take more than we can and more than we're supposed to, that we are also saints at the exact same time. For in our baptism, we were made one in the body of Christ. We are claimed as beloved children of God. We are made saints not because of what we do in the world, but rather because God has made us upright by God's goodness, God's grace, and God's love. For the king that Jesus is, is not one who tries to hold all the power for himself, making others serve his wants and his needs, but rather he is a king that serves his people and brings the reign of God here on earth. Christ is not the king who kills in order to maintain control, but rather he is the king who gains the whole world by giving up, that is, sacrificing his own life for the sake of us. For through his death and resurrection, Christ defeats the power of sin and death in the world and restores us to our rightful place as heirs of God's kingdom. Christ is the king we worship by serving not out of fear of penalty, but rather out of true joy and love. So the question now is this. How do we here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Chesterton, and how do we here at St. Luke United Lutheran Church in Trail Creek, faithfully worship this king who has given up everything for us, rather than worship the king that takes it all in for himself. 
I believe we can answer this question when we take a hint from those magi, those men from the East who have seemingly faded into the background today. We read in the text, And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. These magis did not follow the orders of the worldly king because they know that his way led to no good. Instead, they listened to a call from God, sent in a dream, to go a new way. We, too, are called to go a new way. We are called to live our lives in the ways that Christ did, serving others before ourselves. We are called to stock the shelves of the food pantry, to welcome the stranger with open arms, even during this time of fear and questioning about the motives and the actions of others, to give not only of our financial resources, but also of our time and talents. And we are called to live each day in a way that glorifies that God has given everything to us and glorifies all of who God is. But as we know, we cannot do it all alone. For as Mother Teresa once said, I am still convinced that it is he, not I. If the work is looked at just by our own eyes, and only from our way. Naturally, we ourselves can do nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things. In Christ, we can do all things. This is why God came into the world and continues to remain in this world with us and through us so that he could do all things possible to renew this world, to renew his creation, which he created out of love. So now let us follow the lead of the Magi, and let us pay homage to this newborn king, both in word and deed. And let us begin our travel along a new road, a different way, glorifying God as we go, on that path. Thanks be to God. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I invite you to join me in reciting the gospel canticle. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For you, Lord, have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown the strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of your servant Israel to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebearers, to Abraham and his children forever. Let us pray that everyone will receive the blessings of Epiphany, responding to each bid with the words, Hear our prayer. For all the baptized, that even in hardship we may grow deeper into the way of God, we pray. O God, shining with grace in your mercy, hear our prayer. For believers in all the world's religions, that God welcomes also their devotion, we pray. O God, greater than the church, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the earth, that each season provides sustenance for plants and animals, we pray. O God, preserver of creation, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
for scientists, that they probe what is beyond both and within what we see, we pray. O God, keeper of all knowledge, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the leaders of nations, that they strive for peace and justice, we pray. O God, monarch of all peoples, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the Congress of the United States, that God grant it wisdom for its tasks, we pray. O God, guidance for government, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all pe persons who have means, that they will assist those who have little, we pray. O God, great in generosity in your mercy, hear our prayer. For victims of injustice and prejudice, that their cries be heeded, we pray. O God, compassionate Savior in your mercy, hear our prayer. For children, that they be protected from harm, we pray. O oh God, loving parent in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who are suffering from the coronavirus, that they come to health and wholeness, we pray. O oh God, giver of life in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who have asked for our prayers, and for those we too often forget, that God meet their multitude of needs, we pray. O God, refuge of the downhearted, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For each of us, that as if with a star, God guide us through the journey of life, we pray. O God, light of holiness, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for all who have died in the faith, that at our end we join them in the life with God. O God, goal of our days, in your mercy, hear our prayer. That God will receive these prayers for the sake of the divine infant before whom we kneel. We pray now and forever. Amen. I invite you now to join me in praying the evening prayer that Martin Luther included in his small catechism. Together we pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously protected us today. We ask you to forgive us all our sins, where we have done wrong and graciously to protect us tonight. Into your hands we commend ourselves our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us for this Epiphany Vespers. Please join us on Sunday morning at 8.30 on YouTube for Bethlehem Lutheran and at 10.30 on Zoom for St. Luke United Lutheran as together we celebrate the baptism of our Lord. <laughs>